So we started talking about evolution, about Darwin's theory. Now let's look at some of the evidence for evolution. These are the four main points of evidence for evolution. Uh, we'll do some more, give it some more information on each one as we go along, and there will also be more information in class. But the four main things that um, that are evidences for evolution are fossils, which are similar to modern species but different, biogeography, that is the locations of related groups of organisms in different parts of the world, homology, which is similar similar similarities in, in organisms uh, that have common ancestors. Darwin called this common descent. And then vestigial structures, things that organisms still have but that are no longer used. So let's look at each one in turn. First of all, fossils. Fossils are often embedded in geological layers. They uh, Oftentimes you'll find things in the fossils that resemble modern species. You know, of course, as you dig down into the la rock layers, that the deeper rock layers are going to be older, and the shallower ones are going to be more recent. And as you look at uh, fossils in the different layers of rock, you'll see that the ones um, that are closer to the surface are more complex than the ones farther down. There are also such things as index fossils that are used as references for dating. These are fossils of or organisms that were widespread but lived for a relatively short geologic time so that wherever you find those, the fossils of those organisms, you know the relative age of the rocks that you find them in. So here we have a couple of examples. If, you, if you're finding fossils of pollen grains and elk skulls, you'll know that you're looking at something that's farther in, inland, whereas if you got the clamshells there, you'll notice in the tidal area, and if you find shark tooth, then you'll know that it's from something that's a little bit deeper. And so as you look at the rock strata, you can see the oldest fossils are going to be the oldest rocks at the bottom, and then over time, the fossils are younger and younger as we go through geologic time. You'll also see when you look at fossils of ancient organisms, something like this, this mammoth, woolly mammoth, very, very similar in size and uh, morphology structure to modern day elephants, but they're also very different and they lived in a different kind of habitat. And so we can see that there has been change over time in these organisms, but you can tell that they're, you can tell pretty closely that they're related to each other. So how do fossils form? Well, first of all, the animal has to die and it has to be in an area where it can be, where um, soil can be deposited on it. So oftentimes that happened in rivers or in tidal areas like that. And then you see over time that the water covered and the sediment covered and the fossil or the, the remains of the animal got buried deeper and deeper. And then uh, over time the bone was replaced with minerals from the rocks around them. And then and then eventually, through uplift and weathering, you'd end up with the fossil that came to the surface so that you could collect it. Something that else that came out of the study of fossils was something called biogeography. This is when you find fossils of, of the same organism in different locations on Earth. And we, if we look back into Earth's history, when the continents were all together, you can see that there's a, a definite relationship between um, things that you find in South America and Africa, for instance, the Sinonathus um, reptile that was found both in South America and in Africa. You can find the fossils today. Look at the Glossopterus fossil. This is an ancient fern plant whose fossils are found in South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia. So it's obvious that those were all connected at one time. So this is another thing that shows um, some evidence for evolution that, that not only has the world changed, has the earth changed, but also the organisms have changed over time. Something else you can look at is homolo homologies, and there are quite a few things in homologies that we'll look at here. One thing that you can see in organisms is homologous body parts. The body parts have similar origin but different functions, and here we look at the, the um, bones of four different mammals here, okay, and you can see they've got the same bones, they're named the same and they come from the same origin, but the, f but the functions of the limbs are very different from the human hand to the cat's paw to the whale's fin and the bat's wing. The bones and the arrangement of the bones and the, uh, and the organism, organization of the bones is similar, but the function is very, very, the function and the eventual structure is very, very different. Here we see a number of other organisms, you can see the same kind of arrangement that you saw in the previous slide. You can also look at embryos and the development of embryos from early embryos to later and see that now each one of these is a different species that goes along here, okay, but you can see in the early stages here that all of these embryos look very, very similar to each other 
and over time as they develop their differences begin to show up but it's but if you look at embryos you can see very very close similarities between different organisms here we see some similarities between chick embryos and human embryos you get points out the pharyngeal pouches we'll talk about this more when we talk about vertebrate animals and the post anal tail both are characteristics of chordates and you can see that they're similar somewhat in the chick and in the human embryo even though they end up being very very different there's also similarities in DNA. There are groups of genes called Hox genes that control different parts of the body. And, and you can see that the genes in, in the fruit fly and in the human are very, very similar to each other. There are some others in between, but they control diff the same parts of the body, relative parts of the body. And, um, and some of the functions are very, very similar between those. Another thing you often see is vestigial organs. These are things that, that have been, uh, they're small traces of organs that are no longer useful. For instance, snakes, some snakes have, have limb bones, that, even though they don't have legs, and even though they don't have legs, they still have some of the bones for those. You have structures in your eye called the pica, that little interior part in the interior corner that is the remains of a third eyelid like they have, like frogs have and, 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 um, and snakes. Here we see the um, fossils of uh, whale ancestors, okay, showing the terrestrial forebears, okay, and you see the, the pelvis and limb bones here, and then we have, uh, over time, the, the rhodocetus, which is a similar organism, but primarily aquatic. Then we've got a fully aquatic ancestor, and look how reduced the pelvis and hind limbs are. And then this is a more recent whale ancestor called Balina, and you can see here they're even more and more reduced. So those are vestigial organs that indicate that there, were th there was something there that used to be used but is no longer useful. And this concludes the um, lesson on evidence of evolution.